Hello everyone, my name is Michael Wood. I am a field CTO here with HashiCorp. And I'm here to talk to you today about uh, some interesting and hopefully very provocative things. Namely, culture and how we cultivate it, how we build it up, how we uh, ensure that we're seeing wonderful behaviors across our organization, at least the things that are going to prove to be productive in our overall mission. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is driven out of a little bit of information that I learned in reading through books like Snakes in Suits, where we take a look at what is psychopathy, how hard is it to determine, and where we see it manifest. A lot of what the research uh, that comes out and emerges in this theater starts to look like is Anytime that I'm dealing with very siloed organizations, extremely hierarchical, uh, where it's very easy to hide and not actually produce, uh, if I can manipulate teams to work against each other or counter purposes, these are all elements that exist within enterprises that allow things like psychopaths to uh, flourish or at least to find a place and, and work their magic a little bit. Uh, I'll give a little bit more detail on the psychological side before we jump into organization, how developer platforms, abstractions, and automation and openness can help us uh, reduce the number of spaces for psychopaths to flourish. But I want to lay out a few ground rules before we get started. First, I'm not on a manhunt. I'm, I'm not on a hunt for psychopaths. Uh, this is not about helping you to identify which ones of your friends are psychopathic. This is not about creating fear that you might be working in an environment that has this type of an individual in it. I'm simply looking at the research in and around these types of personality types uh, and the incentives that we create from an organizational standpoint to either help them to flourish or to reduce the number of ways that they can actually um, use that negative aspect of their personality to our detriment or the detriment of our customers. So I am considering things like organizational structure. I'm looking at the incentives that exist, the way that our teams collaborate. And I also wanna take into account what type of outcome we're looking to drive because that goes to the types of personalities that we want to hire and how we want to make, get them to team with each other. So first, let me set a couple of definitions. I think we're all pretty good here, but it always uh, makes a lot of sense for us to establish a little bit of common ground on a terminology before we dig in deeper. First, uh, there's a personality type which focuses more on empathy. Empathy is where I feel very, very deeply for other people. If someone hurts, I hurt. I can, I can empathize. I can understand what they're going through. Like all of these types, there are positive and negative aspects to any of these. Uh, we, we typically think of things like a very empathetic person as being a good person and a sociopath being sort of a bad person. That's too broad of a brush to paint with. The reason I can say that is, an, is someone who is very, very empathetic could be like a mother bear with her cubs. She's very, very empathetic to her cubs, but if those cubs are ever threatened, she's very psychopathic to the ones that she is not empath empathetic about, or around, I should say. Uh, this is something that we might refer to as like a dark empath, somebody who takes empathy and turns it into a weapon or a negative outcome. So just as we go through this, just understand, I'm not saying any of these are wildly awesome or wildly terrible. They're personality types, and we want to make sure that we leverage them uh, appropriately to get the most out of their skills and abilities. Now, granted, psychopathy is a little bit harder for us to work with, but I'll, I'll get into a little bit of why we're looking to sort of minimize this. But empathy at a high level is I can identify with someone else's pain, emotions, uh, what they're going through. A sociopathy is really a, a, an ab, a sort of a, uh, oh, you're abstracted from individuals. You don't feel what they feel. You're sort of an observer. Um, in the uh, wonderful BBC show Sherlock starring Benedict Cumberbatch, as uh, Sherlock Holmes, he describes himself as a highly functioning sociopath. When he sees pain and he goes out to solve murders, 
he's detached. He's, he doesn't feel anything for the victims. He's kind of fascinated by the perpetrator and he's interested in the puzzle, but he's not emotionally invested in the scenario, which, which is more of a sociopathic response. Psychopathic is really where you look at the other as if they are prey. They're somebody you may toy with, uh, but they are sort of beneath you. They're, they're something that you can manipulate for your own gain. And so one of the examples that's typically used there is a cat with a mouse. There's not a lot of empathy between uh, f uh, from the cat to the mouse. And so a psychopath in a human environment is going to be someone who treats someone else as prey or something to be used and thrown away. Um, and the there are several other characteristics that come into this. Uh, psychopaths can hide. They pretend to be something that's very important to you. They'll pretend that they're your best friend while they talk trash about someone else. And then they'll meet with that other person and tell them they're, they, they will convince them that they're their best friend and talk trash about you. And they play the two sides against the middle in order to gain uh, maybe political power, maybe funding for project work, all of these types of things. But this is a psychopathic behavior, and we're looking to uh, minimize that, bring about a bit more empathy. So for this session, it's not who's who, but what are we calling for out of the organization? As we build the cultures that, we, that we're trying to take forward, if, as we move into DevOps, as we're trying to drive innovative, more you know, smaller, agile teams, we'll say, what are the type of personality traits that we want to call for? Do I need some empathy with a little bit of sociopathy, meaning uh, I need you to care about patient outcomes, but I don't need to, you to get so wrapped up that you can't move because you're so emotionally invested, right? I need to be able to move, so I'm gonna be empathy, but with a little bit of detachment so that I can actually treat patients. That would be an example of trying to find a good balance between empathy and sociopathy. So some example incentives, if we're calling for something like empathy, we want to be completely transparent. We want our incentives to be geared around sharing. As an example, if I'm, if I'm really driving an empathetic team, I may not use terms like uh, technical lead because I'm not trying to establish stratification. I'm not saying that because you are uh, the most senior uh, developer, that you have authority over the other developers. That, that is sort of a will to power sort of thing. It, it leads us more into uh, a little bit more sociopathic um, uh, incentive, which I'll get into around like hero culture. Like I wanna be the lead. I wanna have the widest um, uh, scope of responsibility. I wanna have the widest purview. I wanna have the most influence. Those are incentives that are a bit sociopathic. It's, you're trying to set yourself above others. You're not necessarily trying to hurt anybody, but you want to excel. And that, that leads us more into sociopathy. So what I'm looking here is I may, instead of using terms like team lead, I may use terms like anchor. And the goal of an anchor is because you're an anchor, because you've been here the longest, you have the widest uh, amount of um, context for the project the product itself, the code base, the architectural approaches that we're taking to solve these problems, you have a lot of context. And the job of an anchor is to share that context. It is to drive that down into the rest of the dev team and to groom a, a coming anchor because your goal is to be able to move between teams and bring your ideas to other groups. So you're constantly helping others achieve that anchor status so that you can move on and do other, other bits of work, which increases your skill set, increases your purview, more visibility. But the point is, is I've structured, in effect, that particular job set to be more empathetic, to be more sharing, and the incentives align to that. So I want to reduce silos. This is more balanced team style work. Everybody is there working on the backlog. They understand the pluses and minuses of all the features. They understand the user stories. These are all discussed together. Uh, with the PM and maybe the designer, but the idea is that I have a real open format for sharing, understanding, maybe I'm even bringing engineers into user interviews because I want them to hear firsthand what the users are saying, etc. So think of it that way. This is a more empathetic setup. If I start looking at uh, a more of a sociopathic or a more competitive, this is where we get into sort of market forces. Um, in a law firm, as an example, and you're competing for partner, 
Um, it's not, uh, it really stratifies against individual excellence or in, in, in a developer, cir developer circle, it might be more technical excellence. You're going to publish more patents than somebody else. You're looking for awards. You're looking for scope of responsibility. Um, it, it's, it's more of what I would call hero ball to a certain extent. Now, often we want to drive, and, and this is why I say that there's no real cut and dry between these different outcomes that we're shooting for, because in some cases I want to have strong empathy, but I still want you to strive for excellence in your skill set so that maybe you stand a little bit uh, apart from, you're always looking to differentiate, you're always looking to become better at what you do. That's the meritocracy. I, I don't necessarily want to do away with meritocracy because it helps in terms of the competence of the whole team. It gives people things to sort of strive for. But I don't want too much sociopathy because then I end up stepping on others, other folks in order to get what I want out of the, out of the deal. And so I'm, I'm, I may be looking at a bit of a blend and we'll talk about some of the trade-offs as we go forward. But typically this is going to breed more toughness in individuals. A lot of times you'll see this in sales orgs. We'll have more individual excellence, increased toughness. It's really about winners and losers. Um, if you see somebody that, that doesn't make the cut you're, you're not necessarily super concerned with it in, in this type of a structure. And so this, these are incentives that I would sort of categorize a little bit more into the sociopathy sort of realm. And then finally, in the psychopathy uh, realm, very siloed. Uh, information is need to know basis. And so in these types of scenarios, people who are looking to manipulate flex that psychopathy sort of bent that they have where they're looking to play the game. It's a dog eat dog world. I'm gonna play the game. It's highly political, highly charged conversations. People are talking behind people's backs, very matrixed organization, a lot of strong top-down command and control. When there's very strong top-down command and control, this leads lends itself to some of those psychopathic personality traits, folks that really want to try to climb that ladder and manipulate and cajole and, and maneuver in order to achieve those higher and higher uh, positions. And so a lot of times we're talking about like a hardened hierarchy. It gets very politicized, a um, lot of backstabby type stuff, a lot of high pressure meetings. So these are kind of the different environments that we're talking about and kind of the incentives that begin to drive those types of personality traits to excel. So when I talk about, as we look at our overarching cultures and what we're trying to call forth, we wanna structure the teams, we wanna structure information sharing, the tools that we use to collaborate. We want those to align to the, the style of culture that we want to, uh, that we wanna call forth. I think a lot of organizations actually err on the side of going overly empathetic and, and we don't end up with quite as much competence out of the organization maybe as we want. So we need to think in terms of like, yes, I want to have very, very strong empathy, lots of wide open balance teams, lots of information sharing. I'm not looking for that necessarily whole lot of that psychopathic uh, incentive, but I also want to have some things in place, uh, you know, career progressions, et cetera, that call for people to say, look, if you want more, here's, here's how you can go to get more. Uh, but a lot of the measures that we want to put in place are going to be those sharing empathetic measures uh, to, to look towards success. Now, the, the way that we organize the teams and the way that we work will also introduce some of those incentives. And so just as a quick example, one of the reasons why we moved to DevOps and things like test-driven design was actually to bring people like operations and the testing group more in line with production of value. So if I look at a typical waterfall sort of workflow, the uh, operations team is incented to prevent change. And the reason they're incented to prevent change is they're measured by uptime, mean time to resolution. So they, don't want, they do not want to uh, um, create or deal with a lot of bugs. And the best way to reduce the possibility of failure is to maintain a static uh, operational environment if they can. And so they're at a complete odds with the dev team who is trying and they are, they are incented and paid and bonused and et cetera on delivering code as fast as possible, or it, we could call it introducing change as quickly as possible. So one team is introducing change as quickly as possible. Another team is there to prevent chain, uh, uh, change from taking place. Another team might be uh, quality assurance. Uh, if I'm not finding bugs, if I'm not sending you back to the lab to keep working on their code, 
I'm not sure what value I'm bringing. So I'm sort of incented to stop the roll into production by finding bugs and proving my value to the organization. These incentives in a typical waterfall sort of uh, layout uh, drive us to be at cross purposes with each other. It causes us to at least be somewhat sociopathic to the other team. I don't really care what this does to the developers bonuses because it's my job to catch the bug and send you back to back to formula. You know, go back and rework this, go rework it again until until it looks clean. That's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. And so those would be more in that kind of sociopathic incentives. Now, we try to drive a lot of that out through ticketing systems and automation and, and things like that, which we'll get into a little bit further to reduce the sting, if you will, of the counter incentives that we've introduced into the uh, development plans. And this is why DevOps becomes very interesting. Um, build it, you build it, you run it kind of mantra that we would hear out of somebody like Netflix and then moving testing into the development organization to where when I bring down a story off the backlog, maybe I write my test harness first and then I write my code to meet the test harness. This way, automated testing, quality controls are baked into what I'm doing from a DevOps standpoint, and these teams become more balanced teams where that testing skill set is present on the core balanced team. That operational talent is also embedded in that, in that team. And we'll talk a little bit about how that can become overwhelming at scale. And so we have to think about ways to mitigate that. So what does this have to do with platforms? Well, we have to determine what it is that we want as an organization. Do we want innovation? If we want innovation, we're going to have much more open dynamic teams and power down to the dev teams. Now, not, a lot of companies will say they want innovation, uh, and then they get a little bit, I, I had a really good friend of mine I was talking to who said, I'm, I'm building a team of leaders and I'm frustrated because on conference calls, they're pushing back on the strategy. And I said, well, then you don't want leaders, right? You, you want followers. You want people who will deliver against a timeline. So am I looking for innovation or am I looking for delivery against a timeline? Because sometimes those are going to be opposed to each other and I'm going to build or I'm going to optimize for one or the other. If I'm looking for innovation, I'm going to empower them to question my decisions if I'm the executive leader. Um, and I want them to question my decisions because if you really value what we're doing as a business, you're going to tell me when my ideas are terrible. Uh, and as an executive leader, I'm removed enough from the details that I have to trust that they're closer to the problem often than I am. Where I would issue a correction if I'm the executive leader is strategically, that's not the direction the product is going, right? You're, you're out of sync with where we're running to the white space. These are the areas that we need to be playing in these clouds at this scale and so on. So as long as you're within these parameters, right, of the strategic vision, then be creative, right? Build something new. Uh, if if the, the feature set that we suggested in the last conference call doesn't meet muster with customers, we have to make a determination of whether it's more important to err on the side of the strategic outcome versus the, the near-term results for an individual user. But these are things that we get into as we're trying to drive innovation. I expect people to push back against me. Uh, if I am the leader, and I'm, I'm taking this from a leadership perspective, I'm, if I'm the leader and I really have a committed set of outcomes that we've already told the street that we're going to go deliver, I'm not looking for as many leaders, right? I'm not looking for as many people to kick back against the feature set. I'm looking for delivery. And I'm just, the reason I'm, I'm, I want us to be clear up front is it's going to make us happier with what gets delivered. It's going to make us happier in the role that we're driving and we'll hire the right people for the right outcomes. Um, I'm going to get real solid pro project management teams and maybe I'll outsource some of the development, but I'm saying Here, here's the features and these are the dates and times on which I need them to be delivered. Now, I, I think a lot of us really favor the innovation piece. If we're really going to respond in this digital age, we're going to need to be able to turn experiments over very, very quickly. Um, some of what I've seen emerge from the clouds is, is very interesting and very heavyweight in terms of what I would consider cognitive load. Uh, there was one blog uh, that, you know, I won't, one of the clouds published that was saying, you know, DevOps isn't enough. It needs to be DevSecOps. And, and even that's not enough. It needs to be DevSecFinOps and DevSecFinBizOps. And, and we just keep adding acronyms to that because we're foisting all of the company's problems on individual balance teams to deal with all of that. Well, you basically built a company from the ground up, and that's a ton of cognitive load. And this networking diagram 
you know, it was just basically illustrative of the fact that your hum the human mind can't can't fathom all of the various complexity. And so what I'm looking to do is empower developers to focus in on the business problem that they need to solve and not necessarily every conceivable problem that the problem that they're solving could cause in any other system, right? I, I want to find a way to encapsulate their work and automate as much as I can around them so that they can focus on the things that are truly differentiating. And so I'm, I'm really looking to, and this is kind of one of those things that we can talk about as, as it comes to the type of culture that we're building. If we have people who are hands on keyboard making discrete changes to discrete systems, there's a significant opportunity for a lot of these things to go uh, without being in, without introspection, right? Somebody can go and get on a cloud uh, UI, make a few changes to the infrastructure. And when it comes to things like audit or understanding what changes were introduced or even understanding the, the additional complexity or risk that was introduced, very, very difficult for me to handle. And so if we're in more, if we're trying to encourage more of a, an empathetic, open, sharing, we're all trying to hit all of our best practices kind of environment, I may want to move more towards intent-driven approaches where I declare what I want to see happen, I pass it through governance checks, I'm collaborating with security and testing and so on. I want to pass it through all of that in a very clean and audible, auditable fashion because we're all on the same team. You need to see all the changes that I'm introducing. I need to see the changes that your policies are having on the code that I'm looking to roll out. So how do I get to where I'm collaborative, I'm declarative, there's no hiding. And again, if I'm, if I'm combating that psychopathy sort of mindset, they, there needs to be no opportunity to hide the, where, where changes are happening off book or one team is changing something off in the corner and everybody else in the organization is having to respond to it, which you see a lot with sort of the hero ball kind of approach where a, a glorified architect or a tech lead has the ability to break all of the processes and then everybody else is subsequently less performant because they have to respond to the changes that are happening out of the normal orchestration. So if everybody can follow this, the, the pattern of declaring what they want to see happen vetting that declaration and then hitting the system, then I'm able to move closer to a system of coordination, right? Everything is very open. The policies that get published from GRC are available for me to see. As I'm passing my work through, I'm getting immediate feedback rather than six months later after, a, uh, after an audit, I get, a, I get a dump of all the libraries that are out of, out of step or whatever that I have to address. And I'm, I'm doing support on something that maybe isn't even into production yet. So these types of things, I don't want to. I don't want to hate another team because they're throwing bricks at my work. What I want to have is I want to have this centralized system that I can pass my work through and I can get immediate feedback from the teams that I'm tasked with collaborating with, and all of it is above board. We can see what everybody needs, and and part of this is there's really this kind of myth that we're going to have these unicorn-style developer operators that know everything about everything. It's just not possible. You know, I was out, at, I was on, uh, I think it was the AWS marketplace and there were some 170 pages of networking controls. The, the very idea that I would even know what to do with 170 networking controls alone, and that's not getting into the container topologies and ingresses on, you know, on the Kubernetes clusters and so on. If I had to understand all of it end to end and apply exactly the best pieces, I, I, I'm just, I'm, there's not enough time in the day, week, year, month, lifetime to learn everything that's happening in the cloud. So we sort of have to put away this idea of the unicorn and get into and understand that, yes, we are going to have specialized labor. I don't want to go all the way back to ITSM and Waterfall where I'm passing tickets between all of these teams. I may be doing that for a while, but my goal is to reskill them towards automation and service and openness and sharing with the other teams through systems of coordination. And the way that this might look, and I'll, and I'll, wrap, at, I'll wrap right here, is I, I would have the developers perhaps abstracted from a lot of the downstream automation via you know, a developer platform. And so I give them a bit of a, a working environment which is acting a bit as a facade for a lot of the complexity that's happening downstream but all of that other complexity, while it's still going to exist, is being handled by multiple teams. So I'm not having this huge cognitive load 
where the core balance team has to know everything about everything at all times, uh, it's good that they have a wider purview and context because they're going to write better code by doing so. So I don't want to take all of that pressure off them, but I do want to take things like compliance and governance and, you know, maybe it's, I'm a PCI shop or I'm dealing with the NIST cybersecurity framework. I would prefer that you inherit a lot of these things so that you don't have to become a world-breaking expert in every conceivable, you know, security standard that we might have to meet for federal audit. I'd like those to be inherited. And so this gives you a little bit of a sense of a workflow of provisioning of infrastructure. Uh, behind the scenes here, we could be doing things like assigning identity, managing credentials, role-based role authentication so that I know what developers can do, what they can ask for. They're not going to be able to touch the networking controls, but they can create or size their, their you know, development environments, uh, maybe manage some aspects of the Kubernetes clusters and so on. The idea, though, is I want to make sure that they're focused on things that are value adding at the application tier so that they're building business logic and releasing on a consistent basis, especially around features that are making a difference for our end users. They're spending all their time wrapped up in mutual TLS uh, and, and trying to work it across a heterogeneous environment where they're using kind of some Istio and then bridging over into other technologies uh, where their workloads go a little bit heterogeneous. I'm not sure. I, I feel like that may end up being wasted effort or, or, or too much spinning on something that is not necessarily differentiating. Having said that, I'll, I'll just leave it there. I, I, thank you so much for the time. Uh, the, the whole point that I was getting at here is, is psychopathy thrives where I have teams that are at odds with each other. And if I'm really looking to build a culture of inclusivity where where different ideas are welcome and we're not afraid of having our ideas challenged uh, it, it, it's going to be an environment that's going to be much more open collaborative but not so cognitively overloaded that nobody can move because we're trying to understand every bit and piece of uh, technology everywhere specialize share uh, build your incentives out so that we're making sure that people are incented to enable others and make others successful. With that, I thank you very much for your time and I hope you have a great rest of the conference.